mic. Identify yourself. Tell us where you're coming from. Okay, but that was not passing down a well from the people. Para may alam kayo ng gabot na ginagamit dyan sa inyong mga pinagula. Yeah, yes, sir. Please, please. please. So, I, I mentioned earlier that um, <laughs> I mentioned earlier that that one thing about when you did your research, right? And then you did the appendix. That of course it's hard to put the actual dosage. And then and I guess Dom can also add to this. Uh, is there a research team in uh, in PDH that uh, UP Manila that deals with? Uh, and am I right to think it's a question of dosage? You mentioned that everything is poison. I would add to that, citing a classical uh, I will um, add to that that uh, everything is uh, not poison if uh, not taken in excess, including lifestyle, like drinking, and smoking, and all that. <laughs> and which takes me now to another thing. Did you think about well-being? As, um, of course, you mentioned it back in passing, but, but for me, this concept of well-being is very aginhawa for us, is very central. And you know, uh, we have many uh, more senior uh, colleagues, uh, some of them are not retired yet, but they are not even retired, and they were looking into this aginhawa, especially in Filipino uh, area. And, uh, and, um, so this is, I, mean, I know you didn't have to put it in, but it did cross your mind. And then maybe Dom can later add well, about dosage. Is dosage really central in all this? It is it effectivity? And uh, if it's too much or it's too little, uh, then it's not effective. Uh, well, I just wrote that uh, for people perception of healing is not just about literally the physical body. When you say healing, it's not the same as well-being. So well-being is a total, the, the, the total health, not just physical, but uh, emotional, sociological, psychological, physiological health. And when Filipinos define health, we have three major concerns. You have to be healthy in terms of the kalupa, the, the soul, but it's not just for us, it's not just the soul. It's, uh, it, it's something that, you know, the human consciousness, the spirit uh, in the head, is the, the, the judgment. So you have to be well. You have to be well in your kalawa, in your uh, inhawa. And inhawa is not just, you know, uh, in breath. It is located in the body, somewhere in the, in the solar plexus. And so we have words like, uh, I'm not sick. Because when I encounter the masamang inhawa, the masamang inhawa can be arranged many different things, like maybe a person who has uh, uh, not, not good intentions. So you have, and of course you have the katawan, literally the physical body. So health in, in, in traditional Filipino idea of health is not just about uh, health in the physical sense, but all these three elements. You have to be healthy in the kalupa and in the katawan and in the inhawa. And traditional medicine in the Philippines, generally we call them the babaylan. But the babaylan can have many different functions. She could, could be both a healer who employs traditional medicinal plants, but she could also be a healer who mediates between spirits that are not seen or mystical or mystical beings. And so the babaylan just, just doesn't have one singular capacity. She can be, she can have many, uh, many skills, but at least in the book, I only focus on one. And um, I also want to add to the concept of the overdose. In traditional medicine, we there really is no correct dosage. Although some of the plants, they give you a dosage. <coughs> But in the Philippines, we have the concept of hiyam. 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 And so, when the missionaries who wrote the tradition, there is one, his name is Fernando Santa Maria. And he wrote his work in 
1768, and he said, we have, the Philippines is gifted with a natural pharmacy. That he, he wrote it in Spanish. And the natural pharmacy is provided for by God. And so the natives, he said, make your address to us, he has, a, has a, an array of medicines available to them. But while all these medicines have generally good effects, it is not the same for everyone. So in 1768, he says that one, one medicine may work for one person, the other may work for another, because each body is different. And so the idea of dosage is something probably that did not necessarily exist, but the idea of which fits you is something that could probably almost be it doesn't work for everyone, and everyone has its own religion. You probably just have to find to find out what works for you. But today we still we still have that here. Uh, first, before the others respond, I just follow through on that by asking uh, a, a very basic layman's question: What was the state of health of our ancestors? Uh, generally, but let's say let's go back a couple of hundred years. Ini si Martin, marami naman sila. Gulay na patayin, you know, walang junk food, uh, walang pollution. So were they generally healthy? Kung hindi man, what were their what were their most common ailments? Um, what we know is that uh, in the 19th century, let's begin with the 19th century. Mm -hmm. 19th century, they said the highest population levels were Philippines and Indonesia, particularly Java. Mm -hmm. But the reason for that. Um, for that um, uh, observation is because we have the most established birth and death records because of the Catholic Church and also for, for Indonesia. But in terms of health, generally Filipinos, uh, like most Southeast Asians, we experience cholera epidemics. The most dramatic of all the epidemics is cholera, even if the major killer was tuberculosis. And tuberculosis was known by another name, it was called disease. And then there was smallpox and uh, measles. But generally, we were we were very healthy. Um, but it was not only whether we were healthy in terms of being free from disease that was the only reason why our population was was affected. Filipinos and most Southeast Asians. Prior to coming to colonialism, we did not only have to deal with epidemics, we also had to deal with fighting with each other. And so we have famine, which which occurred even prior to colonialism and even during colonialism. We had no famine, we had epidemics, we had infighting between one another um, to settle disputes. We fought. Some Filipinos even engaged in head hunting. So these were things that affected our population. But generally, we were a healthy bunch. Uh, Tom, would you like to, uh, and of course, uh, Ralu, would you like to? I have, I have a problem just to uh, take off where she sure. left and then just sort of work it back to the dosage thing. So uh, I'm, I'm reminded of. Um, something called epidemiologic transition theory, which actually was developed mainly by anthropologists initially. Uh, so the, the, the essential idea is that if you look at the patterns of disease in a given society at a given time, and you try to monitor that over long periods of time, uh, there are certain patterns. So, I mean, if you, I don't know how dated this sort of stereotype is, but the other Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, my impression is that people generally start out as hunter-gatherers and then they settle down and then it's agricultural for a while and then industrialization kicks in and so on and so forth. So uh, with the hunter-gatherer mode of ex uh, existence, then uh, you, we generally equate that with something of an evolutionary, uh, evolutionary optimum. Like over millions of years, the human species evolved for optimum functioning in that, in, in that particular environment. 
and then all of a sudden technology accelerates the pace of development and then you are inevitably stuck in a situation where your the entire social ecological environment where you're in is completely different from what you were evolutionarily optimized for and then that's where you see a lot of uh, major diseases emerging so like the first trend well actually the, 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 the classic transition was supposed to be from agricultural to industrial where you would have initially people uh, having high birth rates but dying young so you have a relatively small population and then with improvements in sanitation, public health, vaccination, uh, maternal and child health, you, you have a dramatic decline in the death rate while the birth rate is still quite high, and then you have this population boom, and then eventually other things happen, like uh, there's more education for the general population, including women who might opt to join the workforce, and at some point probably uh, defer having children, perhaps. And so all, all of these things, so that's the sort of classic transition that was, uh, was uh, first proposed in the 70s, but then the, the first transition from hunter-gatherer to, to uh, agricultural uh, is, is a bit of a paradox because you would think that agriculture would actually be a good thing by providing a stable source of food for a larger group of people, but the downside is that yes, it provides you a lot of carbs, a lot of starch without so many other things like vitamins and stuff like that. So yes, you you can support the growth of the population at higher densities and then it gets complicated because once the population density goes up, then people have a greater tendency to uh, spread germs amongst themselves. So so what, what's happening is that you're you have this you have this situation where your, your nutrition is actually going down quality wise which is setting up your immune system for failure. And then you have this uh, population density, plus animals, plus domesticated animals. If you think about tuberculosis, the general consensus in the scientific community is that it started as a disease of cattle that migrated to humans. So there's actually a pathogen called Mycobacterium bovis, which is the presumptive ancestor of Mycobacterium tuberculosis in humans. In fact, most of us probably have a little scar here on our shoulders. So that's the that's the mark of the BCG vaccine. So BCG is Bacil Calmetgeram, which is actually a strain not of Mycobacterium tuberculosis, but actually of Mycobacterium bovis. So, so uh, I think it's important. I mean, the, the, one of the reasons why I think of th this type of work is very important it's because if you set it within that kind of frame of thinking then you you're able to make connections that you would otherwise miss yeah, because it's I know it's a challenge to span such a long time scale but yeah, uh, where, where, where I'm working there's increasing interest in this sort of well I, I think it's probably just me but you know this idea of big history where we try to put everything on this timeline from from the Big Bang to the present and then try to map everything. Because only then can you work out the connections. And then now we're still undergoing uh, transitions. So, so the third transition is actually these the resurgence of infectious diseases. So I mean we know that in the nineteenth century uh, uh, millions of people died of cholera and smallpox and all these other kind of things, but you know, I mean, in 2015 we had this Ebola outbreak that yeah, almost became a full-blown pandemic, I mean, had it not been contained, uh, and then we have every year, every year there's at least one thing, there's Zika, Chikungunya, uh, mers cov one variety of flu, avian flu, swine flu, whatever, so it's this constant barrage of things, and I like to compare it to you know, the, the 
the notion of the marginal line. And so, uh, well, I think it's it's a good time to think about this because a hundred years ago, the First World War was raging on, and then in the aftermath of that, the uh, the, the French built this massive system of fortifications on the Saint Line, which was uh, the, the premise was that since they had won the First World War, which is essentially a static trench warfare based conflict, if they just beefed up their static fortifications, that would keep the Germans up. But they were confronted 20 years later with Blitzkrieg, and uh, which basically bypassed. So, so what we're actually facing right now is is essentially that it's it's, it's, it's the blitz, but it's 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 Ebola, it's well in a way it's HIV and some other things that we have been control that are just you know they're there. Uh, we we can sort of develop the sense of complacency because it's. Yeah, I mean, you are HIV positive, you can have meds for that, you know, Michael Jordan's... Uh, no, excuse me, not Michael Jordan. Oops, oops, oops. Yeah, Magic Johnson. Sorry, sorry, sorry to the basketball. I'm evidently very sports, indifferent, slash illiterate, whatever. So, uh, so going back to the dose thing, uh, it's, it's difficult to actually quantify things because the, the the baseline is difficult to define. It's like, uh, let's say that we're looking at traditional medicine in the 16th century. It's a very pristine kind of environment. It's not like you can go and buy paracetamol or amoxicillin or something like that. So it's, it's essentially uncomplicated by what you have in terms of modern medicine. Whereas now, it's really hard to find somebody who hasn't taken something within the past 24 hours, or the past week, or the past month. Uh, now we have vaccines. And going back to the epidemiologic transition theory, there, there is a sort of subplot in there known as the hygiene hypothesis, which some of you might already be familiar with. Uh, uh, an another iteration of that is known as the, the um, old friends hypothesis. It's so old friends, meaning germs and worms. So, you know, if, if the mothers there, usually they have this like, antiseptic in their, their, their hand sanitizer in their handbags. So, oh, you touched something dirty, so we have to spray that. So, so it, we might actually be go, going overboard with that. So it's, it's this confluence of things. It's, on the one hand, you are overly sanitizing things, perhaps, limiting your exposure to natural things, uh, altering your 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 makeup, uh, your biological makeup by taking antibiotics. So we always think of our, of ourselves as human having human DNA, but the reality is, in in, our, in the normal human body, there are more non-human cells than human cells. If you do a head count of each and every microorganism in there, and it's not to say that the microorganisms are bad; they're actually an integral part of a normal human body. So those are the things that complicate that. If I, if I take an antibiotic and then that affects the bacteria in my gut, that actually affects my overall metabolism of things. It's like my, the way that my body will process anything that comes after that will, will be changed. So it's, you know, it's we always want to think of it as a, some kind of simple contest. Okay, well, we'll have treatment A, and then we'll have treatment B, and then we'll see who lives longer or who dies sooner or something like that. But it's not that simple to set up. So, and besides, a lot of these plants are actually food plants. They're, they're, they're vegetables. So if you have them in your diet, the question is, should you be evaluating them as if they were drugs, or should you be evaluating them as if they were some kind of uh, food? And sometimes it's actually in between. It's not really one or the other. 
Yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. If you think about Malunga, I mean, uh, should you be making a study of people who have been eating this as a major constituent of their diet for several years, as opposed to you know trying to extract it and put it in a capsule and make people take that for a couple of weeks or whatever? It's exactly. And then uh, yeah. So yeah. And then in a way, Lagundi was lucky. <laughs> Yeah, because, you know, I mean, if you, it, it was validated using that kind of test, but it's, which is not to say it's always fair to apply exactly that kind of approach to the other cases. So, well, like, uh, what people are trying to do is, is that they're trying to look deeper. Like, uh, as a case in point, I have some colleagues at our own department who are looking at, you know, you've heard of all these homes, like the genomes, the... So there are, there's a whole family of them, so genomes, transcriptomes, proteomes, and metabolomes. So, uh, so one has to do with DNA, the other has to do with RNA, the other has to do with proteins. And metabolomes are like all these other things, like the small molecules, like the glucose, the cholesterol, all these other things. Including, actually, the, the molecules that come in from our food, like the vitamins and antioxidants, all these things. So, uh, the, the concept of Hyang is actually something that is coming back in both under the guise of in, in, in the guise of what's called precision health or precision medicine or personalized health. So you know we're just saying that wow, well, if we look at everybody's DNA, for example, it's all different. And even if we have identical twins, if the, the microbes in their guts are different, then they'll, they'll behave. They'll, they'll react differently. So, uh, I mean, the whole thing about Yang, it's easy to dismiss it as parang ah, mo lang, pareho lang yan eh. But there is actually a, a hard biomedical basis for that. And we're just beginning to, to exploit that in a predictable kind of way. That's right. Uh, yeah, I just I was wanting to ask first. Um, you you mentioned Father Blanco and other religious, uh, you know, interested in in medicinal plants. So I was wondering whether they were not only interested in saving the souls of people, but also saving the lives. So, was that the reason for this kind of interest? For <coughs> the religious? For the medicinal ones. Actually, the Spanish missionaries, for lack of records on, on the Philippines and on early Philippine life, they for a corpus of data, when you want to study early Philippines, early Philippines, particularly probably pre colonial or the plan of Spanish content, or the period of Spanish rule, at least for the Spanish period. Um, the missionaries were our, were our early anthropologists, our early men of science, not necessarily scientists, or men of science. Um, they were imbued with a sense of mission to, of course, propagate the word of God, but as men of science, they were also curious about the environment. Um, about the Philippines, and because there were really no, no medical facilities, they were, and the missionaries, in most instances in the Philippines, they were our only representation of Spain. So the idea of the Filipino notion of, of the Spaniards were necessarily almost always just the Spaniard. But for the Spaniards, they were the means, or the, the, the only ones who actually lived with the pre-colonial or the early Filipinos, interacted with them in their everyday lives. And so from these interactions, the missionaries were able to observe how we dealt with our own medical concerns. In fact, when, when, the, Spaniard, when the Americans came to the Philippines, one of the most important works that they produced was a voluminous 55 volume work written by its uh, collection of documents by Alexander Blair by Emma Blair and Alexander Robertson, which for history we call Blairians. 
clear conversion contains most of these uh, missionaries' accounts. But in the former of their Roberts, the Americans, when you study Philippine history, uh, most of the time you will encounter that the Spanish period is a period of obsolescence, or ignorance, or a period of the medieval ages. But through the years, we have tried to, while that observation is not necessarily correct, a lot of it has to do with how the Americans painted the Spanish period for their own particular ends. But in the in the work of, of Baird Robertson, an American who was involved in the project, his, his name is Edward Gaylor Moore, he said that the Spaniards, for all of what the Americans have thought of it, they probably had the most advanced public health system in all colonies at the time of Spanish war. But this advancement is not necessarily good. Public health is a 19th century thing. There was no public health prior to the 19th century. And so when the Spaniards came to the Philippines, they could not give us what they themselves did not have. But in the in, in whatever the, Amer the the efforts of the Spaniards were in terms of public health, those were almost a match in terms of the other colonies in Southeast Asia. And that we owe to the missionaries who were at the forefront of, um, of, of health. I mean, in terms of taking care of health, because Filipinos were um, could not be could be converted if we were all dead. And so we had to be kept alive. But for whatever reason, that, that was one of the imperatives for that. But without the missionaries, then all all of our understanding of Spanish period would not be really complete. It's still incomplete, but they, those words help a lot. We have a question from the floor. Yes, sir. You next. Good afternoon, Bo. Uh, I'm from CMC. Um, I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to ask you the totality of the totality of the wellness in Hawa, in the concept of the Nakamuruan. Uh, itatanong ko lang po kung meron po ba tayo uh, sa tra traditional medicinal plants or sa rituals po natin, meron po nag-deal sa mental health katulad kasi ito po yung mga issue na kinakaharap po nung, nung mag-generation natin para gano'n ngayon. So kung meron po ba or uh, ritual or medicinal plants, thank you. Uh, I know that there are many the, the problem, many capacities and we had healers that catered to mental health. Pero hindi ko talaga na encounter kung meron. Although there are there are plants that I have listed that if you if you take them they can compel the loss of senses. Like for instance, um, you now for instance, um, Asina wrote something on the on, on, on the Dayuma. I mean, today we, we only have the Dayuma as a love potion. But he says that the Dayuma consists of this specific plant. It has no scientific correspondence, but he described it. But he said that too much of it can cause, can impel the loss of senses. There are other plants that can make you, you know, lose your sense of judgment. That's why wives. Uh, let their husbands take it without the husbands knowing because they want the husbands to just do whatever they like. But in terms of mental health that we have, I'm not so sure. Although, peers could also cause mental illness. But they also have that capacity. But for a particular, for a particular medicinal plant, I'm not so sure. 